long time no see. It's time to get started. And so we're coming to the close of one phase of our uh, Sabbath lessons today. Uh, we've been talking for how many weeks now about resting on the Sabbath? Well, this will be our kind of final lesson on resting on the Sabbath, and we're going to start next week then on uh, uh, the, uh, how can I put, the more spiritual side of keeping the Sabbath, keeping it holy, and so on. Well, next week we talk about worship on the Sabbath. How did they do it back then? How do we do it now? Uh, and so on. Uh, so that'll be chapter 9 in your book. Uh, if you want to read it, get it ready. Which I assume you all do. Shake your head. Oh, no, I won't ask you to do that. <laughs> okay. We'll start off here. So we spent a. I'm going to push this off. Oh, okay, good. Because the head is in the way of the text. There we go. We could put it clear up on the. <laughs> we could put it on the ceiling if you want. <laughs> spent a great deal of time discussing the matter of resting on the Sabbath and for good reason. First of all, it is given as the primary function of the Sabbath day. Think about that. Even more than worshiping, God primarily wants us to keep the Sabbath day holy by resting on it. And secondly, the subject of resting is discussed more frequently in the Bible than any other subject pertaining to the Sabbath. Why do you think that is? Why does God spend more time teaching the Sabbath to those people out in the desert in the uh, Saudi Arabian vocational training school uh, we talked about several weeks ago uh, for the old Israelites and for us today? Why does he spend so much time on resting on the Sabbath? What we think mostly of the Sabbath is coming to church, uh, worshiping on the Sabbath, and we're going to talk about that next week. Because it's nothing that we can do, I think, is um, I don't know, a symbol. Like, we can't work towards our faith. It's given by God, just the same as Sabbath rest is given. He wants us to stop our work and accept the Okay, good. I think because it's important and we don't like to rest. So we're a little bit thick skull. We don't like to rest? Boy, don't talk about that to me. <laughs> okay. In, at your age, yes, I agree. Uh, anybody else? I think as slaves, they didn't really grasp the concept of rest. They weren't used to it. Now, I said next week we're going to get into another aspect of uh, Sabbath, and that is worshiping or celebrating the Sabbath. <coughs> now, think about this. If you want to worship on the Sabbath, God says, rest if you quit working 
if you quit doing all of these things on the Sabbath, then you have time to worship. But if you're spending all of your time uh, working, earning money, then you don't have time for worship. Or if you're truly worshiping on the Sabbath day, <clears throat> or truly resting on the Sabbath day, your mind can focus more on the God of the Sabbath. Okay, we've used the Old Testament a lot with some brief references to the New Testament when uh, we talk about the Sabbath. Today, we're going to kind of zero in in the book of Hebrews and what the writer of Hebrews says about the Sabbath. <coughs> He shows, the writer of Hebrews shows us uh, how the Israelites of old time and their experiences were a preview or a type of the life we now have in Christ Jesus. So we're making the transition today from resting to worship. Okay, let's put another one up on here. <clears throat> okay. We have come to share in Christ if we hold firmly till the end of the confidence we had at first. As has just been said today, if you hear his voice, do not hearken your hearts as you did in the rebellion. Who were they who heard and rebelled? Wow. Were they not all that Moses led out of Egypt? And with whom was he angry for 40 years? Back to the children of Israel again. And God took them out of Egypt and he showed them all kinds of miracles starting with parting the Red Sea, then water out of a rock, and manna coming down every day to feed them. <coughs> And yet, what did they do? They complained. They rebelled. They wished they were back in Egypt again. Back there making bricks for Pharaoh. When they had it so nice out there in the desert. They rebelled. They disobeyed God. And what happened to them? Wander in the desert. How long? Forty years. What happened to them during that forty years? They died. They died. Never one of them. They procreated and died. And the next generation then is what God dealt with. It was the next generation that entered the promised land that came under the direction of Joshua. Uh, instead of Moses. So, uh, in the Old Testament, God showed them the miracles. He showed them salvation through all of these things. And they rebelled. What kind of a lesson is that for us today? They 
rebel against Moses. More than rebelling against Moses, what were they doing out there in their rebellion against Moses, saying we want to go back? They were really rebelling against God. Okay. They were rebelling against God. And God said, okay, you guys don't like it. You're going to die in the desert. And your body is like a parade of dead bodies all along the way. And then there was a whole new generation that entered the promised land. And in this book of Hebrews, in this third and fourth chapter, God uses the word rest when he refers to the promised land. They didn't enter into God's rest. Well, they didn't enter into the promised land, neither did they enter into his final rest. So, very quickly, uh, I'm going to skip over some of these and uh, we'll get to the end real quick here today. That's what you like. It. Get to the end. <clears throat> Where does that put us today when we look at these Old Testament folks and there was a whole generation of them died well, except two guys two out of a million is not very much <laughs> but how does that relate to our lives today how are you thinking how does it relate to us today after all that's the purpose of, of uh, studying the scriptures at all. Learning how it relates to my life today. Well, the writer to the book of Hebrews tells us that once we've heard the gospel message, the message about Jesus Christ, his life, his death on the cross, his offer of forgiveness and salvation and heaven eventually. This is all, <coughs> all that we've been talking about in Sabbath keeping is a picture of our life in Christ. If we hear the word and don't pay any attention to it, or we disobey the word as we know it, what happened to that first generation back in the desert? They died. They died. Right there, they're buried in the desert. And so he is saying, the writer of Hebrews is saying, pay attention. Listen to what happened to those people out there in the desert. They disobeyed and they never got to the promised land. They never got to that final rest. And so there are many today that hear the gospel, hear the message about Jesus Christ, his life, his miracles, his death on the cross, but they don't pay attention. 
they don't obey what they've heard. God says if you don't, it's a picture of what happened to those back in the desert. This is the crux of the lesson for today. Take heed, listen to what happened to those folks and let them be an example for us today. <coughs> then he goes on to talk about another rest, a final rest. <laughs> I like this one. <coughs> Heaven is our final rest for those who have <coughs> believed and have gone on to meet with Christ himself. But Heaven is a place uh, where we will be resting. Now, I've heard a number of people talk about uh, what is heaven like. A neighbor of mine back in Pennsylvania, Lloyd King, <laughs> and you would know him, uh, he would say, when I get to heaven, I believe that I will have a farm with no stones. There's, <laughs> there's lots of stones in Pennsylvania. Uh, no stones, no weeds, no nothing. That'll be heaven to me. <laughs> What's heaven like to you? <coughs> Kathy said to to me within the last two weeks. She's been married to me for 18 years now. And she has uh, realized that I am most content when I'm working. And, and the thought of an eternity without working, no purposeful activity, for the good of, for the greater good. Um, I'm wondering what that would be like. To do nothing. Yeah, to do nothing. For well, I've obviously enjoying being in the presence of God and praising Him. Um, having purposeful work for the benefit of those you love and Society, church. That um, that's a really uh, important part of my life that I would. I'm, I'm wondering. You're like my friend. I'm going to adjust to that. Yeah. <laughs> You're willing to try, though. Yeah. <laughs> but when we get there, and it's all done, it's all completed uh, as far as physical work is concerned uh, yeah maybe there's an adjustment to make maybe there isn't perhaps God has enough for us to do to keep us busy I don't know but when we get to heaven there will be no planning for tomorrow because it's all finished. It is done. It is completed. There is no work to do. And uh, to some, that sounds wonderful. And when you get to my age, then you think it's wonderful that you won't have to work when you get there. But you see, there's many different ideas of what it's going to be like. And God didn't spell that out for us. All he says is you're going to rest. An eternal rest. All the time. But he promised to go and prepare a place for us. 
He promised what? To go and prepare a place for us. Yes. He didn't say if it was one huge place for everybody. Now, let me deviate for just a minute here and uh, talk about what Marcy just said. Uh, he went to prepare a place for us. Where did he go? Did he have a box of carpenter tools <laughs> that he went to prepare a place to remodel an apartment in heaven? That's why he came here, to learn the carpentry skills. It's a secret. Now think about this. He's not acknowledging that one. Just <laughs> kidding. Christ went to the cross to prepare a place for you, to prepare a place for me. Because in that same passage, he says, in my Father's house are many mansions. They're already there. And I go and prepare a place for you. I'm going to the cross to prepare a place so that you can inherit one of those many mansions or rooms in heaven. Where we don't have to work. Because there's no work to do. But I am sure that when we get there, we will have ample time to do what God has in mind, whatever that is for us. And I don't think that Brandon will be bored because he has nothing to do. Because I think there will be plenty to do. And what that is, I don't know. But what God is saying to us here is be sure and do not follow the example of those who left Egypt, died in the wilderness because of disbelief, because they did not obey God, they did not obey what they knew about God. And that wasn't a whole lot back then. God was trying to teach them uh, about himself, about the Sabbath, about all of these things. So, I think we will uh, do a test. <laughs> There's no working on the Sabbath, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, there is our test. Now, all we have to do is fill in the blanks. In Hebrews, he talks about the promised land. And that was the, the uh, point of rest for the children of Israel. And so, in the top line there, I don't have my pointer anymore. I don't know what happened to it. Uh, but the promised land was for who? Israel. Israel. For the children of Israel. Uh, how about that? Yeah, saw it. <laughs> okay. So... For whom was the promised land? They were going to rest when they got to the promised land. And this was for the children of Israel. How do we apply that to our lives? Okay, let's see here. I guess we can use one of these. Israel. You want somebody to describe for you? Out here. <laughs> I think that one's meant to be on the marker. That one's uh, meant 
to be on the, the on the transparency. So supposed to ride on there. Yeah. yeah. He's one of the fat markers. With <laughs> okay, the Israelites. Now, what are we supposed to learn from that? What's the meaning of that? What's the application for our lives? <clears throat> we are to obey. listen. Obey and not rebel. Or to <laughs> obey and not rebel. That's We're complaining. <laughs> <laughs> complaining. Okay. <clears throat> Can you imagine them standing there and watching the water come out of a rock? Wouldn't you think that would make them believe? And, and when God sent bread down from heaven, they had no food and God gave them food every day except the Sabbath day. But don't you think they would understand, they would learn, they want to know about God, and yet they disobeyed, they would not pay any attention. They also gave them victory over their enemies. Yes. Well, he provided for everything that they needed, whether it was clothing on their back or food to eat. Their sandals did not wear out over 40 years. Boy, 40 <laughs> days and my sandals are... You know. Those aren't good leather ones. <laughs> okay. This is a, a question based on my ignorance, but uh, were they constantly on the move? No. Through that 40 years? In that 40 years, uh, they would travel until, well, they had a guide. God told them when to start and to stop. When they built the tabernacle in the Holy of Holies, God dwelt there. And shining up from that uh, Holy of Holy place was the Shekinah glory of God. And, and when that glory of God moved, the children of Israel moved. When there was just a cloud there and no shining, then they camped there. And uh, they would camp at one place till God told them to move. Now, I don't know whether that was for years or months or days or how long it was, but they camped at different places. And uh, they would move when God told them to move. And they were camped. They each had their 
place to camp around the tabernacle. There were 12 tribes, and so there were uh, three tribes on this side and three and three, uh, and they had their own special place. So it was very orderly. And when they would move the tabernacle, the Levites, uh, the tribe of the Levites would move the tabernacle piece by piece, tear it down and put it back up, and they would go in front of this long procession of people. Million. When they would get to the new place where God said stop, and it may have been an oasis out in the desert or whatever, uh, but they would stop and put the tabernacle together and each tribe would have their own place on the north, south, east, west side of the tabernacle and they would park there and until God told them to move again. If they did not obey God even in that, there were rebels along the way and God dwelt with them accordingly as they traveled out into the desert. Okay, well, let's move on here. Uh, this is a chart of rest. What kind of rest? Well, the rest in the promised land, let's move on. Rest at creation. Uh, at creation, uh, he created everything on six days and then he rested a picture of heaven. He was done. He completed all of his work in six days. And so uh, rest at creation. These are different kinds of rest. Uh, who rested at creation? God. I don't believe there's any discussion on that, is there? <laughs> we all understand that. What is the application for us today? If God rested at creation, is there anything that we should uh, take into consideration here? Come on. <laughs> we should rest. Example. God was an example for us and so that if he rested, we should uh, take that as an example, at least imitate God if nothing else. Okay. Sabbath rest. Our rest on the seventh day of every week. Who was that for? Everyone. God's people, it says here. God's people. Is it for everyone? That's a good question. It's available to everyone. It's available to everyone. To anyone who wants. Does God expect everyone to keep the Sabbath? He knows us too well. <laughs> <laughs> it was made for man. It was made for man. Okay. Do you think the Sabbath day is for an unbeliever, for heathen, for whatever else you want to call them? Well, it's part of the Ten Commandments, and even heathens aren't supposed to murder. Yes. So, yes, but not everyone follows God's commands. I think there's still a blessing for them if they do take a Sabbath. I mean, the physical body needs a day off. <clears throat> Even your ox should rest. Now, is an ox a believer? That's what it says uh, <laughs> for your animals, and they all should rest on the Sabbath. And the stranger within your gates, which would probably wouldn't be believers. Would be an alien. Or a heathen. So, the Sabbath is for everyone, 
but it's especially for believers. Okay? It's interesting that in Israel today, they still keep the Sabbath. Yes, very much so. And depending where you are in Israel, on the Sabbath day, you cannot go into a shop and buy anything because it's the Sabbath. Everything is closed down. But you just go to a neighboring town, and there they'll sell you anything. So, uh, yes, some keep the Sabbath and some ignore the Sabbath. But God made the Sabbath for every one of us in one way or another. Uh, before, be careful here, Chuck. Uh, before God expects you to keep the Sabbath, what must come first? What does God expect of you before he expects you to keep the Sabbath? Faith. 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 Faith to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Yes, I believe that uh, God expects you to believe, to be a believer in Christ, and then, well, as I look at it, I think that you are obligated to keep the Sabbath once you become a believer. Now, Back in the Israelites' time out there in the desert, <clears throat> they didn't believe, they disobeyed, and so there are many Christians today who believe, but they are disobeying God. And God will deal with them accordingly. So, Chuck, that brings up a question which I, I've had all my life, um, probably 97% of the Christians on this planet don't keep the Sabbath, and you said God would deal with them? I think so. I didn't. It, it's my experience, my personal experience, that the Holy Spirit is alive and well in Sunday keeping churches. Well, I believe that. That's, that's my experience. Yes. but. In as much as they do not obey when it comes to the Sabbath and probably other things, how many of us here are obeying God 100%? Uh, but the Sabbath was a very important thing. It was important because those that keep the Sabbath, that do not work on the Sabbath, have time like we're going to talk about next week, to worship and celebrate. And we're going to look at how they worshiped and celebrated back in the desert and how we do it today. And, uh, why are some bored with the Sabbath? and others enjoy the Sabbath. So. Okay, so the meaning here, uh, the writer of Hebrew says, don't fall back, be obedient and obey God and you will uh, have rest for your soul.
obedience, right? Okay. The rest of eternal life. Who is that for? Well, come on. It should be one unanimous voice on this one. Who is the eternal life, the rest that we've been talking about, who is that for? Christ follower. Christ follower. children of Israel in the desert be an example for you so that you will truly be a Christ follower. So, eternal life is for everyone or every <laughs> believer in Now, somebody asked me <coughs> some time ago when we were talking about uh, working six days and resting one. Now, on our seventh day, we worship, we celebrate the Sabbath. Now, what about a person? that would worship and celebrate on two days of the week or three days of the week. What about working for six days then? How do you relate to that? Is it right or wrong? <laughs> Do you think God is pleased with a person that uh, works five days and worships two? Not if they're neglecting their responsibilities. On, on the other five on days. On the other day, yeah. How about someone who works five days, plays on the sixth day, and keeps the Sabbath? <laughs> Not worship two days, just, just worship, have, have a day of worship one day, a day of five, and play one. And then have a day of enjoyment. Rest is down to enjoyment. Pardon? Rest. Is not enjoyment. Oh, I am no, I'm not saying rest is not enjoyment. But that was my question yeah, I, that I, I asked him last night. I agree with you. I think it, it, and, um, it has to be answered. I, well, that's working for yourself. You take a day of, of, of you know, play hooky on life and you go fishing, or for me, sit in my sewing room and make a terrible mess. That's still working. I, I'm not talking about making sailing work. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm early on in an early week. Chuck said, six days shalt thou labor." Not four days, not five days, but six days you should labor. And I'm I'm thinking that that phrase means do all the work you're going to do in six days. And, and keep the Sabbath, it doesn't necessarily mean that you can't do all the work you have to do in five days and have a day where you don't have to work. I don't think it means that. I don't think we have to work six days. 
you should have a day that you can get out and play golf. Well, now, <clears throat> Good evening. if we have a job that's five days a week, and on the sixth day, uh, what do we generally do? Uh, we still work. We work at home. We cut the grass. We uh, take out the garbage. We, you know, do all of those things on the sixth day. Now, if we can accomplish all of those things in five days and worship two, that's not the question. Okay. We don't have to worship every day we don't work. No. It says worship on the Sabbath and keep the Sabbath holy. Right. But um, I'm, 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 just, I'm just thinking that if God requires us to work six days, that leaves no day for golf. <laughs> Family activity that, that might be fun. Right. And I and I, I just to interpret that <clears throat> six days shalt thou labor, I don't interpret that as I have to work every day. It's just that my labor should be confined to six days or fewer to so make, that you to have make Sabbath, Sabbath a, a separate day of rest. Yeah, okay. I, uh, I would agree 100%. Are there any objections? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think our time has come to an end here. Thank <laughs> you.